Hello again, everybody. This is Dan Clouser, and welcome back to the Journey of My Mother's Son podcast. Today, I'm joined with Michael Harris, who's an author, coach, trainer, yoga teacher, entrepreneur, and co-founder of Endless Stages. Michael, thanks for joining me today. It's really great to, to be here, Dan, and I'm looking forward to chatting to see where our conversation goes. Absolutely. So, like I said before we started recording, you know, one of the things that kind of caught my eye um, and why I wanted to have you on the show is you have a quote on your your Podmatch profile that says, "Igniting the power of stories to change the world," and it really falls in line perfectly with the theme of my podcast. The you know the journey of my mother's son, many little people in many little places, um, you know, which is to really give people who may not have a platform an opportunity to to tell their story. Um, so. Tell me a little bit, first of all, you know, why you feel um, people's stories and storytelling is is so important. I've I've got a couple of little rabbit holes we can go down with with that, but I'll I'll, I'll try to keep it a little bit tight. (laughs) (laughs) No no problem. We we can get out all the rabbit holes we want to go down. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that, that I've realized over the years and coming from a place to where I really struggled with self-esteem for a long time and I didn't really feel good enough or, um, and I didn't really value myself very much, right? And one of the things that I realized as I began to hear other people's stories and how other people struggled with that as well is that I no longer felt as isolated as I felt for a long time. That knowing that there are other people that felt like I did and that struggled with the same things that I did and were able to change that and overcome, um, you know, the low self-esteem, the the lack of self-love, the lack of self-worth, the more that I was able to begin to develop that. So I started realizing that those stories were really important. And as I've dived more and more into story, and even, you know, I I went to Merrillhurst College and I studied storytelling and, you know, all sorts of of different things over over the the years and the, the decades, Dan, is, you know, since the beginning of time, man has sat around campfires and told stories. You know, it's like the best wisdom has been handed down orally, right? Yeah, there's been there's a lot of men, religious manuscripts and, and other types of writings as well. But still, the oral tradition of storytelling is where everything happens. Yeah. You know, politically, personally, it doesn't matter what it is. It's an oral tradition. And then as, you know, I've, I've gone more and more into story and becoming a storyteller myself, I also realized that the first place that I learned how to tell stories was in grade school. And it was called show and tell. Yeah. You know, the teacher would come up and say, you know, Michael or Dan or, or whoever, tell us about your weekend. You've got two minutes, right? And so you'd have to get up in front of the room and tell a story to all your friends in, in your class about what you just did. Now, the teacher at the time didn't say that you were um, doing um, speaker training, but that's exactly what you were doing, Yeah. right? So today, as I help people, you know, tell their stories, it doesn't matter where, where they're trying to tell their story, but especially if people are feeling uncomfortable, they're nervous, they're fearful, which public, public speaking can bring out, is this simply reminding them that they already have the skills to be able to speak in public? They've been doing it ever since they were a little kid. Yeah. And sometimes just that simple aha moment can trigger somebody to be able to get out there and to be able to speak, to overcome that fear. And let me add in, in one more thing here, here, Dan. You know, the story that, that I've had And the struggles that that I've had are going to help certain people, right? And other people, they're going to hear my story and maybe go, okay, well, yeah, great. But I don't really feel connected to Michael, right? 
But then you go out and you tell what whatever story you have about your life and about the challenges that you face, and they'll go, oh, Dan, I really connect with that guy. You know, so we, we all have stories that we can tell that are going to affect some people and not affect other people. You know, but as we're able to tell more and more of our story, I believe that more and more people get helped. We love to hear how other people have overcome adversity, whatever that is, and it, because it inspires ourselves. And I said, I think I said that I was going to say one more thing. I'm going to say one more thing. You know, in, in today's world, Dan, and to all the, all the listeners here as well, there are so many places where people cannot speak up. They cannot speak their mind. They cannot even say certain words or they'll get thrown in jail for 15 years. In our country, we're able to say whatever it is we want to say, whether other people like it or not, we have that ability to get out there and tell our truth, whatever that might be for us. And I think more than ever, we need to do that to make sure that other people at some point perhaps can be able to tell their story without fear. I think it's important. You know, it brings us closer together on so many different levels. Again, there's some different rabbit holes there, Dan, and we can go down any of them or none of them. Um, yeah, but no, it, the I, power I, story is, is incredible. I, I love that. And again, it, it falls right in tune with what this podcast is about. Um, you know, and I, I've always said to people, you know, for me, you know, throwing this out there, if someone's listening to this conversation, it helps one person, then in my mind, this podcast was successful. You know, yeah, yeah it's yeah. great to have, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of subscribers and downloads and all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, for me, it really comes down to, did we help one person today? Um, yeah. And that, that's what I really, you know, liked about that. And, and it's funny how, you know, I never put that together, what you said about show and tell um, mm -hmm. until just now, but it, it is so true. And for the longest time, I was scared to death to get up on a stage. I mean, you know, we ran a, a youth nonprofit organization, so we'd have a banquet every year and I'd have to speak at the banquet every year. I wasn't the keynote speaker or anything like that, but I was always on stage. And for years, I would not be able to eat before I got on stage because I definitely felt that if I would eat something, I would have to go to the bathroom and throw up. Right. Um, and that went on for, for many years um, until finally, you know, something kind of clicked that, you know, I was just thrown into more spaces where I was doing more public speaking, um, you know, being invited to speak at some colleges and different, you know, again, community events and stuff like that. And I found that if I, you know, made con, you know, eye contact with people in the audience and you kind of, you know, see the ones that you were really connecting to, it kind of helped me get, get through that. So now before I speak, I can, I can eat a full meal. I'm, I'm fine. I don't feel like I'm going to throw up. Don't get me wrong. I'm still, I think you're always still going to, there's always going to be some sort of nerves getting on stage no matter what. Um, but it's funny how it, it, you know, for me personally, it's, you know, it's evolved um, over the years. So, you know, it, it really is, it, it's funny, you know, the way you articulated that, that, you know, throughout the history of the human race, most of the wisdom has been passed down orally. And you just think of, you know, spending time with our, our grandparents or our great grandparents or our parents, you know, I mean, those were all teaching moments. So, you know, what, you know, for you, I mean, what did it take for you to understand that all of that really does, you know, turn, you know, it's storytelling and it is wisdom. I mean, and it's passed down for generations. What it took, I, I really think what was, is what's coming up right now, Dan, is that having gone through my own adversity, and I touched on this a little bit earlier about hearing other people's stories that helped me through that. Um, and as I became more and more of a teacher, a coach, a trainer, which I have done for the most part for the last 30, 35 years, 
is I've realized through that, that all those situations had to do with story and conversation, right? And, you know, I, I think about some of my story, and if I can touch on some of it briefly, you know, 1971, I was junior champ at Portland Golf Club. You know, I was a hot shot golfer. I was a, a great golfer, 12 years old, you know, I, I won. But shortly after that, I was in a water skiing accident and I ended up having 60% of my liver removed, gallbladder, cracked ribs, collapsed lung, 21 blood transfusions. Um, I had a near death experience and I came back and, and I'm here, but I still had a smile on my face, but I was still angry with God because I didn't want to come back. I became angry, right. really quite angry. And again, I'm making kind of a long story short, ended up diving into alcohol and drugs and smoking and hanging out with the wrong people. And by 27 years old, I showed this to you earlier. Here's my show and tell prop, Dan, from this is the cane I used to walk on. You know, I could barely walk 10 feet and they ended up doing surgery on both my legs because of blocked arteries and they had said that they would likely have to amputate my legs. They wanted to do more surgery. I left the hospital AMA against medical advice with this cane in my hand. Didn't know where I was going to go. And this is, I think, where story becomes even stronger. The doctors at OHSU, Oregon Health Sciences University, said when it hurts is to rest. Well, I ended up at another doctor in Santa Monica, California. I was living in Portland, but went to this, what's called the Pritikin Longevity Center. He said, when it hurts, keep walking. <laughs> and we were right on the boardwalk at Santa Monica, basically, between, you know, the Santa Monica Pier, you could look out the window and see it right there. And he said, just start walking up and down the boardwalk as much as you can. And it goes basically from there down to Marina Del Rey passes Venice Beach and Muscle Beach and, and all that kind of stuff. So when I started walking out there, Dan, this is why I think physical movement is so important and so relevant to what we're talking about as well, is as I started walking, I was walking through the pain. I was walking through the fear that, that I had. But Dan, the, the, this is the kind of the, the funny part of it too, or part of the funny part of it, I don't know if you've ever been on that boardwalk, but there's a lot of girls in bikinis on rollerblades, right? <laughs> Going up and down this boardwalk, right? They're still doing it today, 35 years later. I was not going to be the 97 pound weakling walking up in that boardwalk next to the beach, right? I wanted to stand tall. You know, I'm 180 pounds, which is perfect weight for me but I was about 137 at the time. I wasn't 97, but I was still pretty skinny, but I wanted to walk up tall. I wanted to be proud. You know, I was a young man. I was immortal or so I thought. Right. But as I started walking up and down this boardwalk, within two weeks, I was walking two miles. So very quickly, I was able to turn around the disease that, that I had, the peripheral vascular disease, the atherosclerosis, by moving through that fear, by moving through the pain. You know, the doctor said, as you walk and the pain is coming up, it's because of intermittent claudication. You're not getting enough blood in your legs and your calves. And he says, as you walk, you start to build new blood vessels and you're sending signals to the brain that you need more blood. So the body in its incredible wisdom, its incredible intelligence starts to do this. But the only way to activate it is to move, right? You can't activate it if you're sitting in a chair, you know, just being worried and scared about what's going on. You have to move your body, yeah. right, to, to, to make it work. So, you know, that was a, a huge lesson at the time. and. You know, coming back to the power of story, I had a lot of people ask, you know, and say, you know, you should write your story. You should write your book. You've overcome this water skiing accident. You overcame 
all all the the drinking and the smoking you were doing you overcame almost losing your legs so i like to say it took 12 years and 79 days to write the books 12 years to think about it and 79 days to write it i made a commitment dan that i was going to write my book in 90 days and my plan when i wrote it was every day i went to starbucks you know i worked from home i couldn't sit at home because too many distractions so i'd go to starbucks every day for two hours and write at the end of two hours i would leave took me 79 days to write my book that that's uh, that that's discipline too um, yeah. to do that because you know again as a you know fellow writer um, there are definitely times where you know I'll sit there and just you know not be able to write a thing at all and and I yeah. remember when we were in Key West <clears throat> we went to uh, Ernest Hemingway's house mm-hmm. I remember the tour guide telling us that he had a, a regiment where every morning. Um, where he, the studio where he wrote was, you know, a hundred foot walk from his bedroom, you know, mm-hmm. across his, his uh, yard. And he would get up every morning and walk to the studio at six o'clock in the morning. And he would, you know, treat his writing like a job. And he would basically write from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. every day. And, you know, when I heard that, I was just like, I mean, that's just incredible because you know, there's some days where he's just sitting there staring at the typewriter, just yeah. not, you know, just nothing's yeah. coming to him, but yet he, yeah. he had that discipline to, you know, to, this was his time. This was his writing time. That's when it was going to happen. And it was just, you know, for me, I, I don't have that discipline as a writer. I, I, you know, sometimes I write mid afternoon. Sometimes I write, you know, early morning. Sometimes I write in the middle of the night. Um, you know, for me, it's kind of like whenever that creative wave hits me mm-hmm. is when is yep. when I write. So it's interesting to see how, you know, everybody kind of has their different approaches to it, for sure. And the, the, there is a lot of different approaches. And, you know, we each need to find our own way. I mean, if, if that's something that's of interest to us, I mean, I know copywriters, for, for instance, that will write in a certain way. I know writers, book writers that will record everything, you know, on their phone and then have somebody else transcribe it. So there's different ways of doing it. It's kind of finding what works for us, but keep exploring. And and I just found sitting at home, I was distracted by laundry and TV and food and, you know, all those things. And if I, if I went and I still do this today, like I got up this morning and went down to a coffee shop for an hour and a half at 630 this morning and I go and I'm able to look at my emails, I'm able to focus in on that. You know, I, I suppose if I went to a psychiatrist, he would say I have ADD, but I like to prefer to say that I'm passionately diverse. But if I focus on one thing for a while, like I did this morning, I'm able to focus. If I had sat at home, yeah, I would have got it all done, but it's part of my routine each day is I get up for an hour, hour and a half, and I go to my local coffee shop and review what I'm going to do for the day. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. Yeah. I love that. And and I loved what you were talking about, you know, as far as getting up and moving and, and overcoming that. And I think you know, one mm-hmm. of the other things, you know, where the power of storytelling comes in, is you know we're all in this thing together you know this crazy ride called life we're, we're all in together and i think um like you said when, when people are out there and going through something similar to what you went through or something similar to what i've gone through throughout my life and they hear our stories and how you know we were able to co- overcome it and get to where we are today i think that's incredibly powerful and i think that's really where um you know they say there's like safety in numbers right so i think when someone can hear that story and be like wow i'm i'm going through that today and look at what michael did to to overcome it look at what dan did to overcome it i think that's really where the the power of storytelling um you know comes into play And, and i think that's why you know even when you come down to just um, you know, 
support groups and, you know, stuff like that, that, you know, building that sense of community is really what helps us, you know, move forward in life. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I think even we all desire human connection, regardless of whether we're an introvert or an extrovert or whatever our personality type is, there's a certain type of connection that I think we, we all desire. So yeah. what, what was it that, that led you to, um, you know, get into the realm with, with endless stages of helping people, you know, I guess not only find their stories, but then help tell their stories. What was it sure. about that, that, you know, made you want to help others do that? Yeah. Again, there's lot, lots of little branches on, on that story. One of the things that, that I heard you say earlier was about this idea that if one person hear something on one of your podcasts and they get benefit from it, then it's perfect, right? That wasn't the exact words, but, yep. um, and I know what, when I wrote my book and this is the, the power of story again, is I had a niece a number of years ago that was really struggling, right? And she was on the streets and drinking and all sorts of different things, you know, living out there in a tent. She ended up in a treatment center in Orange County, California. She didn't really want to be there. And Dan, I don't know how it happened other than, you know, uh, perhaps God or something else made, made this happen. But my book that I had written was sitting on the coffee table in this treatment center. Wow. Again, I have no idea how it got there. She saw my book. She knew it was my book and she read the book and she stayed in treatment and has been sober ever since. So again, if people, if Amazon stops selling my book, I'm okay with that. That one person, especially my niece. I mean, this is, I haven't talked about it for a while, but I normally tear up when I talk about it. Yeah. You know, but she got help and, you know, still sober. So as we move into endless stages and, you, you know, the quote that's on my uh, profile there about the power of stories, I've really realized in so many different ways how powerful stories are. You know, I'm also a yoga teacher. And when I teach, I talk a lot about story and I, you know, I intertwine story within what I'm teaching. My partner, Tyler, I mean, he's a, he's a master storyteller and, has gone through um, the entertainment industry, grew up as a child actor and told stories, and he still does. Um, and so I keep seeing all these different ways that people are getting their stories out. And Tyler and I really met through a mastermind group that we were in, and we just kind of hit it off and started talking about this idea of story. And it's not so much the platform, you know, there's podcasts, there's stages, there's media, but the story's the same. The delivery might be different or, or how it's delivered might be different, but it's really about helping people get their story out regardless of what platform they're telling it on, right? And as we dive into some processes that, that we use to help identify some of those stories, um, people now, because people have come to us say, I don't know what to talk about, right? I don't know what to talk about. And I'll give an example of uh, a recent workshop that, that we did. And there was a, a woman in there and she really wanted to work with solo Christian moms that had kids, but wanted to be in a relationship. So through the process that, that we went through, she was then able to pull out stories in her life and in her experience of people around her that could help her help other people, help these women, you know, enter into re relationships, right? So now she can go out, she can be on podcasts, she can talk about this, she can be on stage, she can talk about it, she can be on Facebook Lives and talk about it. But again, it's the same story regardless of the platform right it might be delivered a little bit different just like me i mean 
there's no two podcasts that I've been on that are the same, even close. Right. Right. So because of your platform, I'm able to come on and we're having this conversation. Essentially, it's a recorded conversation that other people get to listen to. You know, they get to be the, the fly on the wall, the spider on the wall, so to speak. And I think that that's really super cool. So we, we put this uh, endless stages together again, and we will help people with podcasts. We have a strong relationship with Alex at Podmatch, which he's one of the co-founders. And so currently, as of today, I'm number one on Podmatch and my partner is number two. And we've had as many as seven people in the top 10 as members of um, endless stages be in that top 10 in Podmatch. And the reason that that happens is because of the storytelling piece of it. You know, it's not because somebody's good looking or not good looking or anything else. It's about what are the stories that they are telling and how are they telling it? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's incredible. Yeah. So what, uh, and, and I know we're kind of bouncing around a, a little bit here, but want to kind of go back and, and revisit something you, you talked about earlier was just um, the movement, um, you know, where there was a time, you know, you needed a cane to walk and, you know, you gradually kept going and walking through the pain and, and uh, you know, getting up to two miles and all that sort of stuff. And before we recorded, we, we were talking about another podcast that I had done with the founder of, of uh, Mammoth March. And it, it was, interesting during that podcast where we talked about you know the whole concept behind um that event again it isn't about competing with other people it's simply about competing with yourself and putting you know one foot in front of the other and just you know one step at a time and and after a while you're going to do a 20 mile hike Mm -hmm. um and you know i'd said to him at the time i said you know it's such an incredible you know metaphor for life is just you know, doing it one step at a time. So, you know, during that process, um, as you were, you know, essentially, you know, relearning to walk and, you know, pushing those limits and, you know, it started at, you know, whatever, maybe a hundred feet or 200 feet and then 500 feet and then a half a mile and a mile. What, what was it, what was it that drove you to just, at that point, keep putting one foot in front of the other? And then how did that experience actually help you later in your later years in business and in life in general of, again, continuing to metaphorically keep putting one foot in front of the other? Yeah, great, great question. And what's coming up is is sitting at the Pritikin Center and that doctor giving me the permission I almost felt like he gave me the permission to go out and to start moving my body. He says, if you do this, this will happen. Where the other doctors were telling me, oh, no, you better rest. So it's like that story that the doctor told me in that moment, even a couple of sentences long, changed my life. And I will say it was 10 feet, then it was 11 feet. Then it was 15 feet. The 100 feet was huge. If, if I had gone out there and done 100 feet at one time, I wouldn't have been able to do it. I couldn't have done it. So it literally was one foot at a time, one step at a time, you know. So having that permission, so to speak, and I don't need that same permission today, but I needed it then. I needed somebody to say, you can do it. Right. Because I didn't think I could. Right. I wanted to live. I never wanted to die. It wasn't suicidal or anything. I always wanted to move forward. So, you know, scrolling up to today, I can go back and I can look at that experience and whatever adversity or struggles that might come up today pale. I mean, it's not even close. So, you know, whether it's relationship, whether it's financial, you know, business, what, whatever it is, when hiccups come along, I just go, oh, a hiccup. Cool. What can I do? 
you know, I don't look at it as some big problem anymore. It's just there. It's just part of the deal. You know, all leaves or all trees have brown leaves, you know, and my life has its brown leaves. Right. So when those come up, whether it's one brown leaf or whether it's a whole bunch that I got to rake up at one time, it's just a brown leaf. It's like, so what? You know, if God has brought me this far, if in 1971, I wasn't expected to live. You know, that's 20, that's 51 years ago, Dan, 51 years ago, they took out more than half my liver and said I was dead. I was a dead kid. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. And then when they talked about my legs, I mean, they, when they wanted to do another surgery, they said, and I went AMA and left the hospital, they said, you'll lose your legs in a couple months in your life within a couple months after that, probably within six months, they'll all be done. Well, that's 35 years ago, right. you know, and it's just like, no, I'm not willing to accept that. The other doctor gave me permission to move my body. And I took that kind of a permission and kind of as a command. And I'll throw one other thing in there in December 1988, because we touched on this just a, a little bit, is you know, I've been struggling somewhat with alcohol and smoking and doing all that stuff. And I woke up in, in the hospital after drinking all night. And I woke up in the hospital. A friend came to me and he said, are you ready yet? And I knew what he meant, right? Again, almost giving me permission, but asking me if I was ready. And I said, yes, I knew what he meant. And right then I had this almost like a swooshing feeling, Dan this feeling like everything was going to be different. I knew that all those struggles that I had were gone. And I knew that from that moment on, I was going to be okay. Never had another drop of alcohol, never had another syrup, never smoked anything else for that matter. Um, and my life changed. So again, if I can go through all of that and I can have the faith that everything's going to be okay today, then anything that comes along is okay. You know, this too shall pass. Yeah. And if it doesn't pass, then it's not ready to pass. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, the one thing that you said about the doctor giving you permission, um, I think that kind of ties back into the whole, you know, storytelling and, and everything else where sometimes, you know, we need someone else to, to push us in that direction. And I think that's what you guys are doing with endless stages is where you're kind of being the doctor for those people who have this story. So that, that doctor knew you could walk. He knew you could, you know, turn it into the two miles. You didn't at that point because you had only heard other doctors saying, saying no. So in turn, you've turned into that doctor for, the people that are coming to you for endless stories who, you know, they have these stories. You just need to convince them that it's there and show them how to put, you know, one foot in front of the other to get their story out to the public. So again, it, it's, it's kind of come full circle for you in, in that regard. To a a Absolutely. And I'll t tell you a brief story. You know, I've trained a lot of yoga teachers over and I was, I was running a training in, in Acapulco, Mexico. It was a nine-week training. We had 350 people there. There was an individual that showed up there, and I was shocked to see him. I knew him from a couple of years ago. I actually had done a seminar in Raleigh, Durham, and he showed up there. And he was a forensic psychiatrist in the federal prison system. He dealt with high-profile convicts that were lifers, right, the, they were never going to get out of a thousand years because some of the stuff they did. Right. And he really struggled with that because he was going into the minds of these lifers. I can't, I can't imagine going into those minds. Right. But he had been attacked a number of times had been in the hospital for long periods of time from burns and, you know, getting beat up and, and all that stuff. And he started doing this yoga so he shows up at this training in, in Mexico. I hadn't seen him for a couple of years and he shows up. 
And even as a forensic psychiatrist and knowing all this, his self-esteem has struggled. He had a lot of doubt, all of this, just from what he had been experiencing for the last couple of decades of his career. And so he got up and he tried to speak and he couldn't speak. He was just scared. I mean, he was frozen, right? And so at that time, this again, this is 2008, I started asking him, I said, let me ask you, have you ever spoken in a prison in front of a group of convicts? And he says, yeah. And I said, well, what, do you what did you talk about? Well, mental health and how they can feel better about themselves and, and such. And I said, so you already know how to get in front of people and speak. And I says, I can't imagine a group of convicts in a prison. It's gotta be the toughest place to speak ever. You know, I, I've never done that. And I said, so you've done something really extraordinary. So I suspect that if you want to, you can stand in front of this group right now and talk to them as well. Instantly, he got it. And like the next day, instead of being the person wandering around this training by himself, he would have 10 or 15 people around him the whole time. And he ended up going, opening up two yoga studios on the East Coast and leaving the prison system. But it's that permission thing again. Yeah. You know, it's like he already had the skills to do what he wanted to do. He just didn't know it. Right. And I've got lots of stories like that. We'd be on all day to talk about it all. <laughs> no, that, that's cool. And, and it's, it, it is really interesting how just that little bit of nudge can, you know, send somebody in that in that right direction so yeah um what is it you know you've mentioned that you're a yoga instructor a couple times um but what was it that got you involved in yoga i mean i my wife has done some yoga i i am the most un limber person in the world my my hamstrings are so tight that you know, in high school, they were pulling my kneecaps back, touching the joints and everything else. I've, I've never tried it. She's always told me, look, you should try it with me sometime. I've yet to do it. Um, but what got you involved in, in yoga? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'll say yoga is not about flexibility, at least physically, oh, but yeah. you will get more <laughs> flexible by doing it. It's, it's kind of like People that say, well, I can't go do yoga because I'm not flexible. I like to say it's a little bit like saying I can't take a shower because I'm not dirty, because I'm dirty, right? right. So you're going to go take a shower to wash off the dirt. Um, so the Pritikin Center there in Santa Monica in 87, when I went there, they had a little yoga class in the basement. And I had never done yoga before. It was something my mom did. She went to some crazy yoga teacher. You know, it's just like, why do you want to do that, mom? It sounds, you know, silly. But I started doing this yoga class and it was really gentle, you know, because most of the people there couldn't do much, right? So it was gentle stretching and I, I liked it. I mean, there was a part of it that is just like, oh, you know, this feels really good. So when I went back to Portland, I started doing yoga in a gym, one of the local gyms, because I was going to the gym and I was doing uh, the treadmill. Actually, I started at 0.3 miles per hour on the treadmill as well, um, but increased the speed. So started doing yoga. And then by 1993, for the last, at that point, the last six years, I started doing a lot of different yoga, started really liking it. And then I showed up in a hot yoga class in 1993 in Portland. It was hot. It was sweaty. And Dan, it was stupid, right? It's just like, I couldn't believe that people did this. But I felt so good. And I went back again. And I kept doing it. And I kept doing it. And by the mid-90s, most of my career, or most of my life, I've worked for myself. I'm very entrepreneurial spirited. But... I made a lot of money doing option trading. I took a couple of years off and I just wanted to do yoga. That's all I wanted to do. And I saw that there was this teacher training coming up. This was 1998, this teacher training coming up with this guy named Bikram, which is the hot yoga guy, right? 
and there was this teacher training coming up and I thought, wow, I'll go there. I didn't want her to become a teacher. I wanted to heal my body because I still had some aches and pains in my body. Lo and behold, I show up there and he almost tells me the same thing that the doctor told me. You know, it's just like the doctor at Pritikin just said, get up and start moving, right? So I go to this training and I was initially mad at Bikram because I wanted him to show me how to modify. Here I had spent all this money to see this bonafide yoga master from India, dude, right? And I knew he could heal me and he had had none of it. You know, and he would say, and this is the biggest lesson, Dan, I've learned in yoga. It wasn't about how to touch my toes or my nose or anything else. It was, Michael, don't worry about it. Forget about it. Just do the yoga. But I didn't, I wasn't hearing that at first because I wanted to, he didn't understand. I wanted to do something different. You know, my shoulder was hurting because I'd hurt my shoulder in, in the meantime and all of this. And don't worry about it, Michael. Forget about it. So at first I said, I wanted my money back. He said, no way. He says, I've already bought a new car. You can't have your money back. You know, and he likes to say, he liked to joke around like that. So just do the yoga. A couple of weeks later again, here I go. A couple of weeks later, all the pain in my body was gone. All the pain in my body was gone. All the, the residual stuff that I had. And so by the end of the training, and it was 11 weeks, we were doing yoga four to six hours a day and then talking about it in between. I ended up being the, the speaker for our graduation. So I was one of the first hundred Bikram teachers that was certified at the time. There's probably 20,000 now. And once the training was over, again, I still had no interest in becoming a teacher at all. Well, a week later I was teaching, a year later, I had my first studio. A couple of years later, I had another studio. And then I, I started, I, I either ran or taught at 30 of the Bikram trainings all over the world. So I've, I've helped certify about 7,000 yoga teachers. But what I found with the yoga is, again, my body was destroyed. And it, it was part of my journey in what brought me back to life. Again, what ages us, and this is from Emmy, she's the most senior teacher, not only in uh, qualification, but in age, she's 94 now, I think, and, you know, still doing headstands. She's like one of those 90-year-old women still doing headstands, oh. right? And she says, what ages people is not moving your body. Your joints start to freeze up. And she says, as long as you keep moving your body, it's going to last a long time. Yeah. So I'm doing that. You know, I'm continuing to move my body. Now, today I don't own any studios, but I teach about six to 10 classes a month, eight, 10 classes a month, somewhere in there. And I practice three to five times a week. I would like to practice more, but that's where I am right now. And I keep moving my body. Yeah. And I'm not Mr. Flexible, you know, in any you know, way, shape, or form. I mean, maybe more flexible than other 63-year-old men, but less flexible than others, less flexible than Emmy in, in her 90s, you know? <laughs> I always joked with her and, and her husband, Bob. I said, Bob, if you ever die, I'm going to marry Emmy. You know that, don't you? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that, that's so important is to keep moving. Um, yeah. You know, we, we've done some volunteer projects, and there's uh, – gentleman that's helped out on, on several of the ones that we've been, been on, who's a retired contractor. Um, and he's 79 years old and he's out there, you know, using the hammer and, you know, using the saws and just, you know, a lot of the people, you know, 30 years younger than him are, you know, working hard just to keep up with him. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had that conversation many times where he's like, you know, it's what keeps me young. It's what keeps me yeah. going. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, another friend of ours in his eighties, who's out in Long Beach, Washington, you know, we stayed with him for a little over a week and same thing. I mean, he, he was always doing some sort of, you know, some sort of project replacing a door on a carport or something. And, um, you know, so 
he'd come and knock on the door of the RV and he's like, Hey, can you come hold this door for me over here? I'm like, yeah, no problem, Ron. And we'd go out and, you know, he, same thing. He would say, you know, my kids keep telling me I need to slow down and this and that. He goes, I don't want to slow down. He goes, this is what keeps me going. I, I want to keep doing this. I don't care how many projects I have going on. It's what I want to do. And I think that's so important. I mean, I, I try to walk every single day. There's some days where I don't, but, um, you know, for the most part, um, you know, I'm signed up for that mammoth hike in uh, mammoth March in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, me and my dog, I mean, even this morning, I mean, we walked almost six miles and mm -hmm. he, he's 13 years old and <laughs> it, I think it goes the same for, for him, you know, like that's, what's keeping him young. Cause anytime we're in an RV park or anywhere out and, you know, people see him and I walk and they'll come up and pet him and, and, uh, you know, I tell him he's 13 years old and they're like, oh my God, I can't believe he's, he's 13. And he does, he's got the energy of probably a four or five year old dog, you know? Wow. And I think that's so important is just to keep, you know, keep your body moving. So, you know, what, what are you doing? So, you know, we talked about your whole journey of, of walking and moving. Um, before we recorded, you talked about, uh, you know, we we're talking about hiking and where you're at in, mm -hmm. in Oregon and everything. Um, you know, other than the yoga, I mean, it, it was a major challenge for you to get to two miles now, but like, what are some of the, what are some of the distances you've, you've moved, um, since then? Yeah. Well, I'll say, yeah, I'm, I'm in central Oregon and I moved over here in 03 specifically to be closer to the mountains, you know, as I got older, because I, I wanted to be able to hike. And at the time it was, I wanted to be able to hike the trails. Now I like to say that the trails are for tourists, right? <laughs> because most of what I do, 90% of what I do is off trail today. Um, most, of, most of it. And I also, I, I have a commitment for 2022 to climb one butte or one ridge at least once a week. And so far I'm, I'm in line to do that because sometimes I'll do two and then I might skip a week but there's a lot of volcanic buttes where I live, you know, yeah. just there's volcanoes everywhere. So and most of them are remote. Most of them have no trails. So I'll just go park at the base of one of these. Sometimes I'll be with myself, sometimes with a buddy or two, and we'll just climb up to the top, down the bottom. I don't do much with mileage, so I don't necessarily know how far I go sometimes. Right. But I mean, certainly I'm, I can be out there all day. One of the things that I also like to do, and I'm not sure yet whether I'm going to do this this year or go somewhere else, but the first weekend in August every year is what they call the Steens Rim Run. Well, the Steens Mountain is in southeast Oregon. It's fairly remote southeast of Burns, Oregon. And I think this year is the 39th, 38th or 39th anniversary. And it's a 10K that starts at 7,700 and finishes at 9,800. Wow. Right? In the first year that, that I went out there, you know, picture this. You know, here I am I'm at the starting line. There's maybe 150 people there for the, the race. A lot of them were coming out of the desert. But this guy drives up in this big Ford pickup. He's got the cow horns, you know, horns, the long horns on front, all of this. And he hops out of the truck, you know, and he's, you know, covered with dirt. He's got his cowboy boots on, his big belt, his cowboy hat. And he strips down to his running shorts. And I went up to this guy because I knew I had to talk to him. His name was Leon. And I started talking to him. I said, Leon, I said, you know, once we introduced ourselves, says, why are you doing this? What's the deal? I says, you don't look like a runner to me. He says, oh, I run out of my ranch every single day you know he's got a ranch out in the middle of the desert in oregon right and he's doing this run and we became friends over the years and you know whenever i go out there and i go out there most years um but i like i said i don't think i'll go there this year but it's like that idea of being able to go from 7700 to 9800 essentially straight up there's two places that are maybe 200 feet that are slightly down, very slightly, but it's straight up. 
So we'll go up to the stange. We'll spend normally five or six, seven days out there exploring the range and, and all that. And for those that don't know the Steens Mountain, look it up. It's a remarkable place. Again, just it just comes right up out of the desert, and then behind out of the desert behind it is the Alvord Desert, which is the driest place in Oregon. It's just an, an amazing place. But just that again, that idea of being in nature, climbing that mountain. And, you know, like I said, we go a couple days early to start to acclimate to the altitude and we hike around and there's lots of rims up there. It's mostly treeless, but there's lots of rims out there that you can go down that are, I don't know, again, I've never measured it, six, eight, ten miles each one. Yeah. It's fairly rugged, though. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. I, I, I love being in nature. I think it, it definitely grounds you in and uh you know is incredibly healthy to to get out in nature for sure so it's cool yeah so well, and I'll, I'll, I'll add and you, you you mentioned about walking six miles you know a 20 minute walk is two thousand steps it's about a mile yeah so if somebody's uncertain about how far they can walk just go out and walk 20 minutes each morning okay. try to do two thousand steps and it will change your life I and mean, yeah. it cannot help but do it yeah, no, it really will. It really will. Um, so we're just about out of time. Is there anything, I and mean, we've, we've, like I said, we went down a couple different rabbit holes. Is there anything that uh, you want to talk about before we uh, get to my final question? The one thing that, that I would say is, you know, tell your story, whatever it is, whether it's at dinner with a friend, you know, ask your friend, you know, hey, friend, you know, can I tell you a little story about something? You know, think about something. It doesn't have to be overcoming adversity. You know, again, without going too far, when I was 12, 13 years old, you know, I played little league ball, right? And I was playing third base. You know, I'm making the long story short, but uh, we were possibly going to lose the game. There was two runners on. There was a batter up. He was a great batter. And we thought, okay, we're sunk. Line drive to me at third base. I grab the ball. I take the base. Two outs. We win the game. Right? So you, we just don't have to tell these gory, you know, adversity stories. We can tell these incredible things that happen too. Yeah. 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 That's cool. So, Michael, how do people find you? Um, if people are wondering, you know, how to get their story out, how do they, you know, and they're looking for help, how would they find you? Where, you know, where can they get to endless stages and all that good stuff? Best place to go right now is just to my website. It's Michael B, B as in baseball, Michael B Harris.com. And if somebody's interested in finding out or more about speaking and getting their stories out, there's an opt-in there to endless stages. And I'll briefly mention that we have a lot of free resources in there. We have video trainings, lots of different downloads. We like to say that our free resources are better than other people's paid resources. So we have a group of people that are all the way from somebody brand new learning how to get their story out to professionals that are keynote speakers all over the world. So it doesn't matter the skill level, right. but if there's an interest in there, hop in there and, and grab the free resources and start to play around with your story. And let me give you one, one other link. And this link, um, it's easy, but um, it's not visible anywhere unless you put it in. So it's the Michael B. Harris forward slash book. And you, you can download this book, the Falling Down, Getting Up book, which is designed to be read in two hours or less. It's a short story. And it is my story. The first part is the, um, the challenges I face. And the second part is what I did to overcome that. And ideas that anybody can use to overcome it as well. So it's a free book. It's the, at least this is July right now. It's the 10th anniversary of when the book originally went to number one. 
Um, so they can go to either one of those, again, michaelbharris.com or michaelbharris.com forward slash book. Cool. Awesome. Love that. So that brings us to our final question. Um, as you know, the subtitle podcast is Many Little People in Many Little Places, which comes from the opening lyrics of a Michael Fronte song, which go, when many little people in many little places do many little things, then the whole world changes. So it's one of the little things that Michael does on a daily basis to make the world a little bit better place. Oh, on a daily basis. Ah. Or any time. <laughs> one, one of the things that, that I do when I'm out hiking is there's a lot of plastic out there, Dave. There's a lot of plastic out there. Surprising where it shows up. I don't know how it gets out in the middle of nowhere, but it does. I pick up a lot of plastic and I save it. And there, there's a pond that I go to that's not too far out of town, maybe 10 miles out of town. And there's a lot of duck hunting around there. And the hunters leave their plastic shells on the ground. And I've gone out there at times and I've picked up hundreds and hundreds of shells and you know, put them in a bucket and cleaned up that plastic. That plastic gets into the ground, the ducks and the birds and the eagles and the hawks, they pick it up and put it in their nest. You know, plastic is becoming devastating right now. So whenever I see a piece of plastic, it could be small, it could be bigger, I pick it up because I feel, and most people, I mean, I, I don't think it's ever come up on a podcast before that, that I do that, but, you know, I specifically have a bucket in the back of my car to fill the, to fill up with garbage and plastic from nature. I love that. I love that. My wife will do that a lot of times and some other full-time RVers of ours, if we get into a rest area and, you know, we're just there for a little bit, um, she'll grab a bag and go out and pick up some trash and, and get in the trash. And, and that's, you know, you're doing it in the wilderness. I mean, she's doing it where there's literally a trash can, you know, 40 feet from where somebody just drops a bottle. It's like, come on, man, just walk the <laughs> walk yeah, the 40 right. feet, throw it away. But um, yeah, so it's, uh, that's great. I, I love that. I love that answer for sure. So Michael, I really appreciate having you on the show. Appreciate you taking the time. Um, if you get out your way, I'm definitely going to look you up. Um, I think we could uh, have some fun you know, having dinner sometime and exchanging stories as well. So, uh, you know, definitely look forward to that at some point. And, well, uh, you're for, welcome anytime. It'd be great to have you visit. Absolutely. And for everybody out there listening, be sure to check out my other podcasts and blogs at journeymymotherson.com or danclauser.com. Again, Michael, thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate you having me on the show. Thank you, Dan. It's been great.